I'm very thankful for this opportunity, and I'm grateful for the week that we have together. Like I normally do, I take it a bit slow at the beginning just to make sure that everything's working well behind the scenes. And I've got um, a monitor set up just behind the camera, so if you see my eyes kind of flickering to the left, it's because I'm looking to make sure everything that's, you know, going smoothly continues to go smoothly. Now, um, maybe a few announcements while I'm waiting for people to get logged on and uh, to make sure that everything is working smoothly on my end. Seems to be. But I'd like to begin with just that um, consistent admonition that I give. If you have a question or a comment, if you're excited about the lesson, if you're wanting to um, communicate about it, please reach out to me in a private message. I don't interact with the comment section. Um, it is distracting to the lesson. And so I'd like to encourage you to reach out privately. In uh, You can use Facebook Messenger if you're on Facebook. If you're on YouTube, you can, uh, I guess, send me a private message or an email. And uh, if you want and you know my phone number, you can send me a text, and I'll do my best to look at it. But just remember that they are distracting. So let's do our best to study together, and then uh, after it's over, that's whenever I'll be able to answer stuff privately. Well, it's the final week, and um, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth about how you feel about it, you know. I guess there's the joker in me that wants to think that maybe uh, you're tired of seeing my ugly face and ready for me to be done. But several of you have reached out and uh, have mentioned how thankful you are for the studies. And so I just wanted to take a moment at the beginning of the week to say thank you so much for all the encouragement that you've given me. Several of you have reached out time and again to lift me up, and I'm so thankful for it. Um, I didn't know how long this was going to go, but in my home state, our state is starting to open back up, and it, it's a slow process. You know, it doesn't mean we get to go out and do whatever we want whenever we want, but I know as our state and our nation starts to open back up, that doing a daily Bible study may be not the thing that is what our brotherhood needs at this time, what people need at this time. And so I am kind of pivoting away from the daily Bible study, and I'll be doing some other things, returning to some things that I've been traditionally doing. But then also, I mean, this format has worked so well that I am going to continue doing whiteboard lessons, but just not the frequency of it. Um, another couple of announcements. First, I have had some people who've been interested in helping me uh, with the purchase of a new camera, with the purchase of a new computer, and then also, I've mentioned that I'm going back to school this fall to pursue a marriage and family um, therapy licensing. So I'll be doing this master's program up at TWU, and it focuses on family studies and marriage and family therapy. So I would be a licensed therapist. And uh, I'm going to continue to preach, but I want to have that as another tool in the toolbox to use to help people. And if you're interested in helping support that, the tuition of the, that expense, or of the camera, or of the computer, I've had some people reach out across the week and they've wanted to send some money. And I just want to let you know that that need is still there, and I'm trying to still work towards those things. Thank you so much for people who have wanted to help so far. I will have a couple of guys locally here at Denton County that will help me stay accountable. So I'm not just asking for this money and then it goes into my private bank account. But I will be having a couple of brothers who help uh, oversee it or coordinate it with me just, you know, so I can stay above reproach. I don't want to be the type of person that ends up getting busted for, you know, having a uh, whatever sort of Lamborghini in the driveway or whatever. That's not the type of preacher that I want to be. However, I have come to note that my shortcomings is just providing my own equipment. It is helpful for others to help me in that ministry. So let's balance it together properly, shall we? Okay. So this week we're talking about questions that the Bible asks me. And like some of the studies in the past, I am standing on the shoulders of greater men. And I've had some who've reached out with, uh, you know, study ideas. And I've had others who've, you know, it's content that I've come up with and I balance it with content that others have uh, suggested for me and given me their notes. I just want to give a shout out to my dad. Doug Edwards, who has been very steady for me over these past few weeks in support, and he's also been helpful for me 
um, with content. And so this is a, a series of sermons that Dad has shared with me from his preaching. And I really like the idea of asking questions. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about asking questions. And then we'll jump into the, the lesson, which is, am I my brother's keeper? So thank you, Dad, for your continued help over these weeks. I'm thankful for you and for your preaching. Now, uh, instead of a main idea today, this week we're going to have a, a verse of inquiry. You might call it a memory verse. But specifically, it's Proverbs 20, verse 5, and I want to explain why it's a verse of inquiry. Now, this is kind of a mixture of a couple of translations. The, the easy-to-read version, which is one that I like to read with our kids, and then also the New King James and uh, it says, getting information from someone can be like drawing water from a deep well, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Now, I want you to think about someone's heart and the way that we, uh, you know, study with someone. We're, we're trying to get the truth into them, but we're also trying to pull out of them their understanding. If somebody has a great understanding of the Bible, then you know you don't have to start maybe at the very beginning. Or if they have zero understanding of the Bible, you can't begin with a great expository study on a specific passage because they might not even have, you know, this scope of what it's about. And so we really need to be able to draw out of people uh, what they understand. We also need to be able to draw out of ourselves. We have to be introspective. And I love questions. Questions help provide introspection. And that's why all week long we're going to be asking some of these great questions that the Bible asks We'll look at the questions in context, because it's not fair. If last week we talk about in context, and then this week we just pluck things straight out. But we're going to take things in context, and then we're going to find application for those things beyond the context. Ways that uh, we can use other scriptures to help us answer the question for ourselves. Now, here's a, a, an extra lesson across the week. So I've got five lesson opportunities with you. But I'm actually going to be teaching six lessons. And if you look in the um, description on Facebook and in YouTube, if you look in the description of this video, you should see a PDF copy for something called The Power of the Question. And this is observing Jesus in Mark chapter 8 and all of the questions that he asks, but also kind of the deeper reasoning behind why Jesus asked these questions. Now, Questioning is very important, and I can't stress that enough. If you plan to study the Bible with others, then you need to be ready to ask questions. Do not become a sage on a stage. That's one way that I've heard some put it, and I really like it. Don't be a sage on a stage when you get with people and then you do all the talking. But try your best to engage by asking questions. Why? Because you're getting information from someone. You're drawing out of the well of their heart their understanding. Now here's some uh, information about Jesus. I'm not sure if you knew this or not, but I'm going to share these three facts with you. Jesus, let's see, let me get my paper over here. Jesus asked in the Gospels 307 questions just realized I didn't write the word asked. So there we go. Jesus asked 307 questions. Now, obviously across Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a lot of those are going to be repeats. But there is at least a hundred original questions in the Gospels, and there's a total of 307. Have you thought about that? 307 questions. Now, Jesus was asked... He was asked 183 questions. Okay, that means others were asking him in the Gospels. Jesus only directly answered eight. Now, some sources will tell you three, and other sources will tell you eight, and so I decided to go with the bigger number, just, you know, it's still overwhelmingly impressive that he spent in the exchange between questions and answers, he focused more on the question than he did on the answer. 
Now, the answer obviously was very important, and Jesus would preach, he would use parables, he would respond to questions with questions so that people could get at the answer for themselves. Jesus was drawing water out of their heart, pulling out of them the truth that they needed to know, because uh, there's a lot of great facts out there about asking questions and answers, etc., but when you just tell somebody a fact again and again and again, that's not the same as making them inquire. I was a school teacher for seven years. Inquiry was one of those buzzwords that we just used again and again and again. The idea is that you are trying to make your learner crave the information. You're trying to draw out of them their understanding. And Jesus did that so frequently. He rarely just answered someone's question, but he always asked them to go a little bit deeper. Now, what I want you to do is I'd love for you to print this out. And I know that maybe in this lesson specifically, it's going to be hard for you to get to a printer and back in time. But if you're one of those that enjoys taking notes with me, then I want you to print this off and take notes with me. And by Friday, we will uh, complete the whole thing. And I think that will be just a really neat extra lesson in this series of lessons. Now, because I've gone a little bit long in my introduction today, I had planned on doing two. But let's just do one for today, and then we'll make up the rest across the week. Now, the first question on this handout from Mark chapter 8 that Jesus asks is, How many loaves do you have? And you might think that he's just asking that to ask, well, how many loaves do you have? But when you study Mark 8 and you understand that Jesus already knows the answer and he's trying to do something a little bit more, there's really there's a defining element to his question. And on the handout, it calls it the definition. And what Jesus is actually doing is he's trying to encourage reasoning. He's wanting his disciples to get to a level to where they can have faith in him. You know, they ask, well, who can feed this amount of people? And when he asks, well, how many loaves do you have? He's encouraging them to reason out. If he's capable to perform such miracles, could he not provide for these people the way that uh, he has provided for others in the past? Now, the scripture specifically that this is found in is in Mark chapter 8, verse 5. And there's motivation behind the question. You know, he's obviously encouraging their reasoning, but why is he doing that? And the, if you're filling it out, you could write down that Jesus fosters personal growth and discovery. Personal growth and discovery. He's wanting people to hear this question and to answer for themselves, can Jesus provide for me? Is Jesus, if he is the Son of God, is he capable of doing things that are beyond what I thought he was capable of doing? Now, the last part of this is really neat, in my opinion, and that is we're taking Jesus' questions and we're going to find a sample application because what we want to do is we want to emulate Christ. And that means that you are going to ask these types of questions too. When you're having Bible conversations with people, when you interact with somebody, there may not always be opportunity to say, let us open our Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 8. Rather, we find ourselves having to ask questions, maybe at, on our lunch break or in the elevator or in the parking lot. And what we're trying to do is draw that information out as we have opportunity. And so what I would say for this sample application, and this is probably one of my number one questions that I ask in Bible studies, is what do you think? We're asking our person that we're studying with to reason. We're asking for them to grow personally, to discover the gospel. And so that question, some people are scared of it because they don't want to lose control of the conversation. They don't want to get out of the driver's seat where they're controlling the Bible study. But friend, let me tell you this. When you ask questions and give opportunity for them to answer, you are in the driver's seat. And what you're doing is you are driving the Bible study by giving them opportunity to reason and to grow. You are drawing water out of their heart. And you are allowing them to explain their understanding so that you can better teach them the Word of God. So make the question, what do you think, essential in your Bible studies. Now, here we go in the question, am I my brother's keeper? 
This is not from Mark chapter 8, but rather this comes all the way back in the book of Genesis chapter 4. So let me put a little circle around it. And we're coming out to Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Now, in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, we're coming across the two first, uh, the, the firstborn and the secondborn, naturally born people in the world. The daughter, or the sons of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve obviously were made by God, but after they fall uh, from grace and they, they are kicked out of the Garden of Eden, Eve has her first son, and his name is Cain. And Cain, the Bible says, is a farmer. And so he's the one who's called to work the land. Next, she gives birth to another son. And his name is Abel. And Abel is a shepherd. And so he has responsibility over the flock. And here's my flock of sheep. And little puff balls everywhere. There we go. So this is Abel. And this is Cain. Now the Bible says that they both offered sacrifices to God. And uh, we could go a lot into that, but I, what I'd like to do is simply compare and contrast their sacrifices very briefly. Now, the one thing that they had in common is that they both offered a sacrifice, right? But uh, Cain's sacrifice was the fruit and veg of the ground, and Cain, Abel's sacrifice was a lamb or lambs from the flock. Okay, so there's the first compare and contrast. They offered different things, even though it was a sacrifice. The next thing that it says is Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. That's a little bit different than the word unacceptable. Cain's was not accepted. Abel's was accepted. And the big question that you might have is why? Why was Abel's uh, accepted and Cain's not accepted? And I'm not going to go into a lot of the speculation that a lot of people go into. What I think we need to do is consider the scriptures. And the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 simply says that Abel offered a sacrifice by faith. Oh man by faith. There we go. And so the inference of that is that Cain did not offer one by faith. And you know, some people talk about how he offered a sheep and he was offering uh, fruit and vegetable, etc. But there are times in the Old Testament where the Israelites were to offer a grain offering, uh, etc. And so it was acceptable at times to offer this type of sacrifice, and uh, there are other times when an animal is needed. Now, I want to pause here to make this point. Uh, I have interacted with some people who've said, well, obviously, what they offered wasn't important. It was the heart only. And what we can do is we can take that concept and apply it to today. And today, it doesn't matter how you worship God. What matters is that you worship Him from the heart. Now, I do believe that the scriptural reason that Abel's sacrifice was accepted was that he offered it by faith. But I'm not willing to say, to go beyond uh, this, this, I guess, line of reasoning that people have to suggest that it doesn't matter what we do. I do believe it matters what we do. The Bible shows us that it matters what we do. Just today, I was reading in Revelation chapter 19 and 20. That was the Bible reading that I'm go through in my Bible plan. I'm just about to finish the New Testament. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, it talks about the judgment. You want to know what we're judged by? According to Revelation, we're judged by what we do. And so what we do matters. And I want to emphasize that, that what is done matters. We, we just don't know. There's not information in this account about what was commanded or required. But please don't take that and run with it by saying it doesn't matter what we do, just as long as you have a good heart. 
that's not the moral of the story here. The moral is one person did something in faith and the other did not. Okay, very quickly, moving on with the context and then we'll uh, move into the application phase real quick. Well, Cain, because his sacrifice was not accepted, it said he became sad and he became angry. And what I want you to think about is that that anger and that sadness, it's like a ball and chain, right? On one leg, he's got sadness, and on one leg, he's got anger. And these things just eat at you. They eat and eat at your heart. And if you've ever got sadness or anger, resentment, hatred towards another, these they, they don't just go away. They have to be resolved. And whether that's through prayer and, and reflection or whether that's through having a good conversation with someone, uh, there may be different ways that we resolve it. But just holding on to sadness and holding on to anger towards another is not uh, God's way. In fact, God comes to Cain and in verse 7 and 8, some of the most powerful teachings in this uh, scripture, Genesis chapter 4, and God says, why are you sad? And why are you angry? If you did not do right, do you not be accepted? This rhetorical question of, if you had just offered by faith, you would have been accepted, Cain. It has nothing to do with Abel. It has everything to do with you. And God even says that you have to be careful because sin, it's at the doorstep. It's crouching. It wants to control you, but you must master it. And so the concept here again is what's going on in the heart. And Cain's heart was bad. Now it doesn't say that Cain was bad from birth. What it says is that after he did something that wasn't in faith and after he was no longer accepted, then he became sad and angry and then he started to resent his brother Abel. He looked at him differently than he did before. Well, the story does not end well. It ends with poor Abel going down in history as the first person to be murdered. And Cain to be the first person in history who's known as the murderer. When he takes Abel out into a field and then kills him, God comes again and God asks a similar question to Cain that he asked to Adam and Eve. God asks, where is your brother? Now, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had fallen into sin and they had uh, eaten from the tree of the knowledge of the fruit of good and evil, they took uh, this forbidden fruit, they ate it, they ran and they hid, and God comes walking through the garden and says, where are you? God already knows where Adam was. And so there's something bigger here. There's this concept, right? Right? I mean... I didn't plan this out, by the way. This just kind of worked out. But isn't it amazing that God is trying to get information out of someone that he wants them to confess, to bring forth what they know instead of being, you know, like a parent to a child where the parent does all the talking and the child just kind of sits there and takes it. God says, where are you? Hoping that Adam is going to call out what happened. And when, when he says that he hid and he says, well, who did this? And Adam goes on the blame game, etc. Well, the same thing's going on here with Cain. God says, where's your brother? He already knows. But he's drawing out of the, his heart what Cain needs to say and uh, hopefully a confession or remorse. Unfortunately, he doesn't get either of these things. Cain answers God's question with a spiteful, sarcastic, rhetorical question by saying, am I my brother's keeper? Now, Cain is frustrated and angry. He's wrong. He's sinned. And so he's asking this question in spite. But sometimes people ask questions that they don't realize uh, the implication of the question. And they don't realize that maybe there is an element of prophecy or an element of connection between what they're asking and then down the road in the future. So we could end this story simply by 
answering that the, the, the rhetorical answer to his question should have been, yes, yes, you are your brother's keeper. And God even says, you know what? I already know what happened to your brother. If you're not going to tell me, his blood's crying out on the, to, from the ground to my ears. And Cain goes on to get cursed and cast out. Not only is he cast out of the garden, so to speak, because his parents were, but now he's cast out of their protection in the world and he's going to go off and be on his own. So the, the narrative ends in Genesis chapter 4 uh, with this sad ending of Cain falling short of God's glory and going off and basically starting a line of evil people who don't live by God's will. Now what we're going to do next, and this is the final part of the study for today, is uh, we're going to ask the question again ourselves, but instead of Cain saying, am I my brother's keeper, we're going to ask it in our tense, and that is, are we our brother's keeper? So we've taken it in context, and now we're going to kind of extrapolate or move beyond the context to consider the question itself. Are we our brother's keeper? Well, here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to write down these two scriptures, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament is actually a couple of scriptures. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and then Leviticus chapter 19. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus verse uh, uh, chapter 19, we have what is commonly known as uh, the greatest commandment and the silver commandment, right? or the, the second greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Jesus repeats that in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On this hangs all the law and the prophets, Jesus would say in the book of Matthew. So what I want you to think about is when Jesus is asking this, or answering this question that somebody had gave to him, what is the greatest commandment? He answers it well, they say so, but then they go on to ask a couple of follow-up questions. And so what I want to do real quick, just maybe illustrate it for us, that this person My illustrations are off today. In a couple of different places, when these are asked, uh, people don't like Jesus' answers. And so, in Luke chapter 15, one question that he's asked whenever Jesus talks about how you have to love your neighbor as yourself, one person says, Who is my neighbor? And he's asking it to justify himself because he doesn't like what Jesus has just said. And I think we can also be there, so to speak, even though maybe we're not uh, in the flesh. And we could be asking the same question, who is my brother? And who is my sister? And Jesus is going to answer those questions. And the New Testament answers those questions. And so that's what we're going to do. Is we're going to answer those questions. The questions that the Bible asks me, am I my brother's keeper? The answer should be yes. But then naturally you ask, well, who is my brother? And how do I keep them? Who is my sister? And how do I keep them? Well, we're going to consider two different categories of who our brother and sister are. The first one that we'll talk about is the lost soul and how we are brethren, we are brothers and sisters because we've all been made in the image of God. Let's start with that. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 verse 28, God said, let us make man in our image. And when you think about that, you ask, how, how do we bear God's image? You know, do we look like God uh, as far as, you know, does he have my eye color? Does he have my hair color? That's not what this scripture's teaching. But the image that we bear that makes us like God is that we have a spirit, an, an eternal part of who we are. It is our essence, our core, our personality, our identity. It's our spirit. We are a spirit having a body experience, not a body having a spiritual experience. 
So after this life, when my body wastes away, my spirit will go on. And at the resurrection, I'll be given this, this spiritual body, the spirit body, spiritual body. Sorry, I get a little bit messed up on that. However, the point is this. I'm not the only one who has a spirit. You have a spirit. Every single human being has a spirit and was made in God's image. And so that's why the lost soul is my brother or sister and is your brother or sister. And listen, friend, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you have a soul. And in a way, we're related because we're connected to God through our spirits. Now, you still have a sin problem, friend, and you need to get rid of that sin problem because there is another type of brother-sister that we're going to talk about in just a moment. But I want to begin with this plea and this admonition for you. This connection that we have in a spirit doesn't mean that we're all going to be saved. We have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I wish to... I wish that you would please consider what the gospel's message is, and that if you would like to become a Christian, that you would like to have your sins washed away, please reach out to me privately. After this is over, let's talk, and let's see what we can do to find people who are nearby and plug you in and get you connected to a local church family after you've had your sins washed away at baptism. Now, I'll just write these verses down for us very quickly, and that is Romans Chapter 1, verse 14, where Paul talks about how that he has been called to go to all men, Jew and Gentile, right? He wasn't called to just go to one people group, but he had to go to everyone. Why? Because the lost needed the gospel, and he felt compelled to go to the lost, and he didn't care what their background was. He wanted to go and share the gospel with them. Going backwards one book to the book of Acts, chapter 10. Verse 34 through 36, Peter uh, was a, a Jewish man who was given the opportunity to be the first one to preach to a Gentile audience. And the first Gentile converts come because of his preaching. And when he sees uh, that God has opened the door to them before they obey the gospel, before they become Christians, but when he sees that the Holy Spirit is at work in this place, he says, Truly, I see that God shows no partiality. And in whatever nation, those that come to him, that God is willing to receive. Now, there's the great news in that, that the lost soul, it doesn't matter where you're from or who you are. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your language. It doesn't matter your culture. None of that matters. I am my brother's keeper by taking the gospel to that lost soul. And you, friend, Christian believer out there who is listening to this message, that's how you're your brother's keeper is by sharing the gospel with the lost. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus had compassion on people because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. And so he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray that the Lord will send more workers into the harvest. My Christian brother and sister, man, we, we need more workers in the field. And however you can help in that endeavor, if that means you want to be on the front line, if that means you're supporting those who are on the front line, whatever it is, I call on you, please. We need more workers in the field. You are your brother's keeper. The souls of those around you, you have a responsibility to them. Take advantage of the opportunities you have. Okay, here we are very quickly on the idea of my, uh, am I my brother's keeper? And now we're going to be talking about baptized believers. Baptized believers are a special type of brother and sister because we've been adopted into the family through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God is our father. Jesus Christ is our older brother, so to speak. And uh, in faith, we are all one in Christ Jesus. We've been adopted. And that adoption is a love of choice. You know, a natural born child, I have three natural born children and I love them with all my heart. What's so special about adoption? Many of you have adopted children. Maybe you were adopted yourself, or you've been involved in the foster care, or the foster work, etc. That's a love of choice. Taking one who is not your own naturally and naturalizing them to become your own. That's very special. Thank God for people like you. If you're one of those that works in that line of work, that you've opened your home in that way, Thank God for people who've done that for you if you were adopted yourself. 
We're talking about a spiritual adoption through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We've been adopted. And I simply want to share some scriptures real quick. First is John uh, chapter 13, verse 34. And that is by what we will be known. We will be known by our love for one another. Ask yourself the question, am I my brother's keeper? The answer has to be given based on your love for one another. Now, I have seven one another's. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, I've actually done a study on this way back in week one on Bible chains, the one another factor. So if you're interested in, in spending a whole Bible study on the one another factor, then I want you to go back to week one in Bible chains and check that out. But I'm simply going to write these down and ask you to do the same, and then we will be done. But one scripture talks about how we are supposed to receive one another. And I tell you, that word just bothers me all the time. I never feel like I write it correctly. We are to receive one another. And that comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Write it down. Receive one another. That means that wherever you go, and whoever you're interacting with, when you come across a brother or sister in Christ, there should be this reunion. You know, it's like a family reunion. And I'll just share this. Uh, I don't travel as much as, as some preachers do, but I do get to travel, not in the past month and a half, obviously. But when I hold gospel meetings and I go to new places and I'm meeting new people that I have nothing in common with except for the blood of Christ, I feel as comfortable in their home as I do any of my friends because of that common connection. And I've stayed with people around the world in different continents. I've stayed in homes that are extremely humble compared to what I am, extremely extravagant compared to what I have. And all of the ranges of these people, when, when I am received, I feel loved. And that's how we can be our brother's keeper or our sister's keeper. Okay, the Bible says also that we are to edify one another. And I'm just going to put O-A. Edify one another. That comes from Romans chapter 14, verse 9. We have to teach each other. You want to be your brother's keeper? Ask them questions. Study the Bible. Edify and teach and encourage. Very quickly, we serve one another and we bear with one another. And these both come from the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, and Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And so there's this service mentality, a ministry, where you ask, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes, and the way that I show it is by interacting through service and helping out my brothers and sisters in Christ. Find, uh, the last three there is forgive one another, and submit to one another. And both of these come from the book of Ephesians. Write that down. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 and chapter 5 verse 21. Think about the people that you don't get along with. People that if you weren't related spiritually through Jesus Christ, you might say, you know what, I just don't want to interact with that person. But through Jesus, you have to now forgive those who normally you might not forgive. Submit to people that you might not normally submit to. This is all because of the question, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes, even the ones who you might not like or get along with. Last one, we have to consider one another. And that comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. One of my favorite scriptures. Considering one another to stir each other up to love and to good works. There are so many more one another factors. And I invite you to consider that other lesson I have on it. But we use that to just emphasize this point. The question, am I my brother's keeper? The answer, yes. Just as this guy asked, well, who's my neighbor? And we may be asking, well, who's my brother and sister? The New Testament helps us understand that the lost share a connection with the saved. The only difference between the lost and the saved is the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away our sins. We could do the same righteous deed, 
But without the blood of Jesus Christ, that righteous deed accomplishes nothing. But with the blood of Jesus Christ, that righteous deed, the, the living that Jesus asked us to do, from Matthew chapter 5 through 7, we talked about that a few weeks ago, right? But that righteousness that's supposed to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, that's what we're going to be judged by. Thankfully, the blood of Jesus washes away our sins, and we're able to stand before God in judgment with hope and with assurance. So, am I my brother's keeper to the lost? Yes. Am I my brother's keeper to baptized believers? Yes. I want you to ask that question today and every day. Am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is yes. Okay, we're going to have prayer, and then I'll close out with a couple of announcements, and we'll be done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this week of studies. Please help us as we ask these questions, as we consider these questions that the Bible asks, that we would draw the water out of our own heart. We pray that we would be introspective and that you would help us to get out of the way when we are proud, to humble ourselves so that we can ask these questions legitimately and be willing to reason from the Scriptures. Father, we pray that you would help us to consider the question, uh, am I my brother's keeper? And that we would consider it both towards the lost and towards the saved. And help us to be a brother or sister to those who need the gospel, and also a brother or a sister to those who have the gospel, but maybe need encouragement in their own special way. We pray that you would help us to remember that it is through the blood of Jesus that all of this is possible, that our sins are washed away in the blood of the Lamb, and that we are not the ones who are responsible uh, for the great redemption price. We pray that as we continue to live faithfully, that we would have the mindset of those unprofitable servants in Luke chapter 17, verse 10. Help us to think about that, that we're just doing what you've asked us to do and nothing more. Father, we pray that as our country begins to open back up, state by state, that those that are taking extra precautions would be patient, that those who are opening up would be patient and still take precautions. Help us to be uh, loving and patient and kind with each other. Bless our government. Bless our doctors and nurses who are still uh, figuring out what's the best course of action. Help us to be patient with them. We pray that we would have a heart full of mercy and not of judgment. We ask your blessings on the sick and the poor. Please look into our hearts and see those individuals that we're thinking of. We pray your blessings on them. Bless others who are doing works like this online. We pray that their studies would be fruitful and blessed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining me today. And I'm looking forward to the next uh, four days with you. The final four in this series on questions the Bible asks me as well as the final four in this extended seven-week series of Bible studies made available here at Pure and Simple Bible. Uh, I would love to hear from you. If these studies are helpful, please send me a private message and uh, help encourage me. I could use it. And also, I could use some direction. If you're interested in what Pure and Simple Bible does next, then I'd love to hear from you in that regard. I made a pitch or a plea for a uh, upgrade for my camera, for my computer, and then also for the tuition as I go back to school this fall to pursue a master's program in family and marriage therapy. So I will continue to talk about those all week long. Uh, tomorrow morning I'm doing my final Bible basics where we're going to talk with the young and the young at heart about a common salvation. And last week we talked about a common concept of being lost and found. Tomorrow we're going to take that concept of lost and found, and we're going to look in the book of Acts at people who were lost and what they did to become found. They all encountered Jesus, but what's interesting is what they had to do when they encountered Jesus. We're going to make a chart together, and I invite the young and the young at heart to make that chart along with me, and then at 11 o'clock we'll be back for the second in this series of questions that the Bible asks me. I hope you have a wonderful day. And may God bless you in your continued studies. All right, let's say goodbye to YouTube. Bye, YouTube.